So this is the MRI, the neuroimaging course, uh, Foundations of Neuroimaging course. And uh, so there's a, I have a one page, there's a, the one page syllabus there uh, that you can uh, grab, which is also on, also on the website. So, okay, so how many people we got? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, Almost everybody here. So there's about, there's about 20, 25, 25 people listed in the class. So, okay, so, so what's this class about? <laughs> So we will start off with, with uh, sort of the assignments and, and resources. So the syllabus police made me call it an exam, but there's basically two, uh, there's, there's two MATLAB assignments. Okay, so how many people have, have done MATLAB already? Okay, so that's a reasonable number. It's about the same as, as always. So if you haven't done MATLAB, get it installed uh, uh, on your computer and figure out how to do 2 plus 2. That's the, <laughs> the, the first thing. So that may be a slightly painful thing uh, to do, but, but uh, just do it. You don't have to do MATLAB also. You can do it in, if you know R, you can do it in R. If you, if you use Mathematica or Octave, there's like a m multiple different, uh, different ways to do the assignments. It doesn't have to be done in MATLAB. MATLAB is just kind of the lowest common denominator, and we have a uh, we have a, a campus license, so you can you can uh, get a get a copy of it for free. So um, so the two assignments, the the, the two take home assignments are basically are basically MATLAB problems, a series of MATLAB problems. And uh, I already posted um, take home assignment zero, which is if you haven't done any MATLAB, figure out each line of MATLAB, there's like six lines of MATLAB that I put there, figure out what they do and, and, and how they work and just fiddle with them. So, so look at, it's on, it's, it's on the website, just look at uh, assignment zero and just kind of kind of figure out, uh, uh, figure out how to do that stuff. So, so what is, you know, so, so what's the, what's the overall look of this class? So this class is about neuroimaging, it's about basically the Foundations of neuroimaging, the mathematical foundations of neuroimaging, and it's it's a strange class, uh, and I'll, I'll sort of go into the history of how how it came about. It's not exactly an engineering class or a math class, but it's also not exactly a regular psychology class. So we're going to go into a lot more detail about the actual math underlying it, but I'm going to go over it slower than they normally would in an engineering class. So you can't get out of it, but it, it's going to be slower. And so, so why is the class this way? Uh, the reason the class is this way is because I, and I, I used to be a neurophysiologist like 30, 30 years ago, but then I changed over to uh, doing neuroimaging, MRI, and I run the, uh, the MRI center on campus. Um, and for many years, I did MRI. I didn't really understand how it worked, uh, but I actually uh, was doing you know, MRI experiments in the early days, in the 90s, early days of uh, functional MRI. Um, yeah, it's definitely on. Yeah, I was just checking. <laughs> um, uh, so so what, what happened? Well, I, toward the end of the, end of the 90s, I said, oh, I, should really teach a I should teach a class on on how MRI works. And so, so I got out some of my MRI textbooks and I started reading through them. And I'd already, it's not like I'd already hadn't taught a class. I'd already taught like sort of classes for neuroscience and psychology students about, uh, about MRI. Uh, but as I started looking through the books, I realized, whoa, <laughs> you really don't understand how it works. Uh, so I, I, I was already doing research. I had a paper in Science Magazine, but I still didn't really understand uh, really understand how it works. And so what happened was I, I, that was a couple months before I taught the class. And so I got, I, I got to work and I kind of fought my way uh, into a basic understanding of it. The, the MRI physicists didn't help me that much because they didn't know what I didn't know. Uh, so my background is not originally in engineering uh, and, and math. 
And so they didn't really know what I didn't know. And so I, when I would ask them a question, I, I would get an answer that I couldn't understand, <laughs> really. So, so what is, what is the, so, so how did I fix that problem? Well, I just kind of beat my head against the, the wall until I finally sort of got a basic understanding. Did I, you know, was I able to remember it after the first time I taught it? No. Uh, and so I had to go back to my own notes thousands of times in order to make it sink in. And so I had to literally go over the same material like five times before I could actually remember it. And so I understand that. There's no way that you're going to be able to remember everything from having, having done this class. And really, what's the point of the class? The point of the class is to make, it, to make you feel that you could understand it. <laughs> it's possible to understand in a very concrete, uh, concrete way. So that's, that's, that's kind of the goal goal of this class. And so, like I said, it took me, you know, years of going over the exact same material multiple times in order to actually, you know, finally, finally make it, make it stick. Um, so, um, so that's the, uh, that's kind of like the overall, overall look of the class. So there's, uh, there's the two MATLAB assignments, two big MATLAB assignments. They're mainly about the block equation. That's the first one. There's a bunch of problems there um, on sort of plotting out the solution to the block equation. And then the second one is all about the Fourier transform, a bunch of questions about how the Fourier transform works. So, and that's critical to, uh, to basic, uh, uh, basic operation of MRI. Now, as we'll see in the topics, it's not just MRI. We're going to talk about MRI, and then we're going to talk about um, some of the analysis, a little bit of the analysis of MRI, and then we're going to talk about um, analyzing things on the cortical surface, which is what I'm, I'm known for. And then also EEG and MEG, like what makes the signal and, and how do you try to localize the signal? So, all so a number of different methods of, of neuroimaging. Okay, so, so that's the, the two main uh, take-home homeworks are those two MATLAB problem sets. And I'll give them to you a couple weeks in advance, and you'll, you'll need a couple weeks to, uh, to hash, hash them out. But basically, the idea is you, you hash them out, and then you send me one PDF of uh, your code and the graphs. Don't send me like 20, 25 uh, attachments, just one, one, just one PDF of the, um, of the code and the graphs. And the problems are not, are not hard. They take like maybe five lines of MATLAB or something like that. So they're not, uh, uh, they're, they're not really hard. The problems get harder as you go down. And if you don't sort of get to the later ones, or you, that, that's OK. Just, just make, make a college try. <laughs> I definitely want you to do the first three or four. You have to do the first, <laughs> have to do the first three or four. And I'm totally happy if you guys want to work with each other. I, I want a, a hand in from each person, but if you want to work with each other, that's, that's totally fine. I encourage that because it, it's very helpful to have more than one set of eyes on these things, especially when you, if you haven't done it before. Okay, so those are the two main assignments. And then there's a final paper, a short final paper. So the nature of the final paper is, is also a little different than uh, in many other courses. I don't want some overall uh, review of the literature, sort of a general review of the literature. What I want you to do is to go to the original neuroimaging literature. It could be something to do with a particular pulse sequence for MRI. It could be some, something to do with a new method for localizing EEG. It could have something to do with how to, say, refine the cortical surface estimate, but basically a methodological paper, a methodological paper, and I just really want you to review one paper. I just want you to go in, into one paper and sort of figure out how it actually works. And what you'll see is that if, you know, if you go, see, the problem, I always say this every year, the problem is that us old guys used up all the easy stuff. <laughs> so, the nature of the literature is that, you know, people did some easy stuff early on, and then what, what happened was, like, there's slimmer and slimmer pickings as time goes on. And so if you, if you get a modern paper from the last 10 years and read it, it's just like, whoa, 
what is this? I can't understand this because it depends on all these previous things. And so really what I want you to do is go and get one of these original literature papers from something like magnetic resonance in medicine, like MRM, or neuro Im neuroimage, uh, a, a journal like that, and just fight through the paper, just one paper. So, so that's, that's, that's the, uh, the written assignment. So I don't, want, I don't want a review of you know, language in the brain or anything like that. I want you to just kind of like fight your way through through one paper. And you should email me to, with some example papers, and I'll tell you if, if, if that's a reasonable one uh, to use. OK, so uh, everybody OK on the assignments? So basically, there's the, there's the lectures, uh, and uh, uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday lecture. And uh, there's also a second advanced lecture at 8 AM on Friday. So uh, so that one, there won't be one this Friday. OK, so no 8 AM lecture this Friday. But basically, every Friday, there'll be a more advanced lecture. And anybody can come to it. It was, you know, it's nominally listed for the graduate students, but it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Any, anybody can come to it. And uh, you can also, if you want to come to it and ask questions about something that happened in the regular Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 9 o'clock lectures, you're, you're welcome to do that. And so everybody's, um, everybody's welcome to do that. The, it, it'll be a little bit more advanced uh, topics uh, on the Friday lecture, Friday 8 a.m. lecture, bright and early <laughs> 8 a.m. <laughs> OK, so that's, uh, so there's lectures. And I, I, I made a, uh, uh, it, it usually it takes like a, a, a couple days to get the media site opened up so that you can get to it from anywhere. But once, once we get that working, I just have a page of links to the, uh, to the lectures. And the, the ones from last year, which are not going to be very different from the ones from this year, are already up there uh, also. So you can already get to those if you want to sort of look at anything uh, in advance. OK. OK, so any? Question. Oh, uh, then one more thing about sort of course materials. So, so the main course materials are the, are the lectures, uh, obviously. But uh, I also have uh, about a 125-page PDF of class notes that's on uh, on the website. They're handwritten, and so you know, so you wonder, like, you know, don't you know how to use a computer? <laughs> I'm really good at computers. I'm a good programmer. I know I know how to use Photoshop. I know how to use Illustrator. And but it just turned out that what I found was that at least if you're like me and you don't have like a really strong um, you know engineering math background, I like to annotate the equations. Like there's an equation that maybe has like five or ten parts, but I need little arrows telling me like what's this part and <laughs> what's what's that part doing. And to do that in Illustrator is kind of a pain in the butt. And so I found it was actually easier to, to just hand write them out and, and scan them. So they're, they're 125 pages of <laughs> scan notes. There's an index in it now. There's a brand new index at the front uh, so that uh, uh, you can, you can uh, sort of see where you are a little bit easier uh, in the notes. And so that, uh, and I usually update that every year. You know, I, I find errors or I add a page or two. So. Um, but but you know definitely download that and, and and take a look take a look at that. We won't go through everything in the notes, but we'll go through like two thirds of the stuff in, in the notes. So quite quite a, we'll, we'll cover a lot of the stuff in the notes. So so that's another resource that that handwritten notes. Uh, on there's no official textbook. Uh, if you're going to do uh, neuroimaging or fMRI in particular. Uh, I list a number of, of, of different books uh, that you might want to get. Uh, and there's, a, there's one, there's a good one by Scott Hutel uh, that's sort of a, a pretty good general, general purpose book that might be a good book if you just wanted to buy, to buy one book. But if you look on the, um, uh, on the class webpage, you can, see, you can see some of the standard books in neuroimaging and, and fMRI. There's also uh, a list of readings there. 
sort of especially some classic papers in fMRI and neuroimaging and cortical surface stuff. So you don't have to read all of those. Uh, I just put them all up there so you can sort of get some idea of the kind of papers that I want you to actually go to the literature and write, write you know, a review of. That's a, of one paper. So, so there's, there's a whole bunch of readings, uh, readings there that you can, you can take a look at. And it gives you some idea of what journals these things appear in. So um, you don't have to read them all, but they're, you know, they're, they're just there for, uh, there for reference. So let me cover you know, the paper, the class notes. Struggling to start with MATLAB. Yeah. yeah I mean, MATLAB is, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of ugly. You know, what it, what, what it was, there, there's, a, there's a language, that, like back in the 70s when I was actually learning learning computers, I learned a, a language called Fortran. I don't know if you've ever heard of a language called Fortran. It's an old, it's still in use. Like all the nuclear bomb simulators, they still use Fortran. Um, so MATLAB started off as like a scripting language for Fortran. <laughs> That's actually how it got started. So it's kind of a messy, ugly looking scripting language, but all programming languages are more or less the same. Once you learn one, if you can fight your way into one, then it's not that hard to sort of uh, learn another one. They're, they're all slightly irritatingly different. Uh, but uh, uh, but you'll, you'll, if you haven't done it, any kind of programming at all before, it'll be mental pain. Uh, but it's all, it's all for good, right? No pain, no gain. You need a little sort of mental pain in order to, in order to sort of, you know, uh, move forward. So if you haven't done any MATLAB or any programming, definitely immediately look up some MATLAB resources online or get, find somebody who knows MATLAB and, and, and just start messing around. You just got to mess around. The, the best thing about MATLAB is you can, with just a, a couple lines, you can sort of do something. You can, you know, plot a graph of something or do a Fourier transform that just takes like, you know, two lines. Read in an image, do a Fourier transform of it. Display the image, the three lines. So, so, so definitely start messing around if you haven't, uh, haven't done that. Okay. So, yeah, so any questions before, just on, uh, before I sort of like go over some of the, uh, some of the main topics, any questions about, about the class or what we're going to cover or, so, yeah. What's that? There will be a canvas for the course. There, there is a canvas, yeah. There is a canvas for the course, but it's just, uh, it's just the rump canvas. Uh, the, the, the page that I, this is the page that, uh, that, I, that I regularly update. Yeah. So there won't be any, the, the, I, I think you have to log into the canvas. I think I made it so you have to log into the canvas to get the, uh, to download the assignments. But uh, uh, because, so that they weren't just, uh, completely generally accessible. So that's the only thing that you really absolutely need the, and, and I post the, you know, that's the other course, yeah. So yeah, you, you only need to get into the canvas to, to get a hold of the, the assignments. But the first one, that, that, that homework zero is already posted, so you can, uh, you, you can get that one already. Okay. And, and also the end of, uh, on the, on the web, uh, on, on this web syllabus, uh, all the individual pages of the PDF are, are are linked there as you as you go through the class. You can if you just you can immediately get to us to one of the single pages of the class notes. Okay, and generally over the years, I've had people from all different mixed backgrounds. Some people have already done MATLAB and are, or have some engineering background, and then I've had people who are just like. Have, have had none of that, and I take that in consideration when I'm when I'm looking looking over the assignments. So I know there's some people. If you haven't done MATLAB at all, obviously you're not going to be able to uh, be up to speed with somebody who has you know a couple years of experience with it. So that's okay. That 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 that's okay. Don't don't worry about that. Okay. So. Yeah, so like the point of the class is, is that you, you can actually understand this. And if, if we look at some of the topics that we're going to talk about, so one of the topics that we'll talk about 
when we talk about the, the Blanc equation are simple differential equations. And, yeah, you know, I've got, I've got some math books in my library. I've got differential equations. Got a, probably got like five or ten differential equations textbooks in there. Did I ever read any of them? No. <laughs> so eh, about uh, ten years ago I said, maybe I should just read page one. Literally, page one of the differential equations textbook. And that's what we're going to go over, basically. Well, maybe page two or three. Uh, but just to get an idea of, you know, because the Bloch equation is a differential equation. And in order to understand how to use it, we have to solve it. And so what's the difference between sort of a differential equation and a solution to it? And with, with some very simple examples. So we're going to go over, uh, go over that. Um, and that's a generally useful thing that's useful in all different, it's not just useful for fMRI. Having sort of a basic understanding of what a differential equation means is, it's kind of a generally valuable thing. Same way for the Fourier transform. So the Fourier transform is heavily used. It, it, wasn't, it, it, it wasn't specific to MRI. It was, you know, it was like hundreds of years ago when they first, you know, thought it up. And so uh, understanding the Fourier transform, having a deep understanding of the Fourier transform is... Uh, is a, is a generally useful thing that goes beyond, you know, just, uh, just MRI. And so that's another way of sort of looking at the class, even though we're going to focus on it I I with respect to reconstruction of images uh, from the MRI magnet. It's, it's a generally useful thing to really understand uh, deeply. And we're going to go over it slow and slowly enough so that, so that we can really get a good feel for it. Okay, so so now the question is like, why would you actually want to understand some of the math behind neuroimaging? And this is a question that was asked of me by my psychology colleagues. They say like, well, who's going to take? Who wants to take this course? Why why bother with this? <laughs> and I always you know draw this picture like you know here's here's a uh, Here's a physicist, uh, and then uh, here's a psychologist over here. So the, the psychologist over here, and they're talking to. Yes, yeah, it kind of looks like, like the alien. Okay, so, 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 <coughs> so they're talking to each other. So, so why would you ever want to talk to the physicist if you're sort of a psychologist or a neuroscientist? Well, you, it turns out they're working on the latest new thing, uh, the latest new MRI thing. But the problem is, uh, if, you, if you talk back and forth, what happens? Well, you know, this, like, here's the physicist. See, this is the physicist, okay, physicist. So the physicist is talking to the psychologist. You know, wh what's he thinking? He's thinking, oh, man, those psychologists, they don't understand how MRI works. I can't really talk to them. All they do is break the magnet. They always complain. <laughs> You know, and then what's the psychologist saying? The psychologist or the neuroscientist is saying, you know, this is what, what he's thinking. He's thinking like, you guys don't really understand how to explain how this thing works or tell me something useful that I actually need to know. <laughs> and you're always working on these stupid, obscure things that I can't really understand. And, and it, it's not clear how they're going to relate to, uh, to, you know, what I'm interested in. So, so what is the you know what is the the point of this course is partly sort of anthropological, uh, is anthropological because how do you actually talk to a, a psychologist or a physicist? Well, you've got to actually incorporate some of the ideas that the physicist has in their head in order to be able to talk back and forth at all, and vice versa. The physicist has to has sort of understand, you know, uh, what your goals are, in order to be able to talk to you, and so that's one of the reasons f for the class is to is to understand enough about how the thing works that you can, that you can actually sort of uh, have a conversation where you pass information and find out their latest tricks that they might not even know might be useful to you. So, so that's, that's you know, one reason, reason for this. The other reason for it is if you ever do any neuroimaging research, you'll be faced with, you know, computer screen with like about, you know, hundred or so parameters on it. And if you don't understand how the thing works, you're going to treat it very superstitiously. It's like, don't change anything. 
it's like, you know, I'm not sure what that one does, but just, you know, let's just do it the same, you know, so we can get some good data. And so one of the other reasons for learning some of the, the background to this is to give you a little bit more dominant approach to doing your experiments. Like, you know, so you won't be just afraid of changing anything. You'll have some idea of like, if I change this, you know, what is, what is it going to do? So that's another sort of pep talk for, you know, why you want to understand a little bit of the, a little bit of the background. Okay, so let's just go over sort of the, uh, the main uh, topics uh, in the course. So, and, you know, there's, there's, there's quite a bit of, there's more lecture time than um, in some other courses, but um, hopefully that's all, all for the good. So, so what do we start off? So we start off with uh, the hardware. So on, on Wednesday, we'll uh, sort of go over the main, the main pieces of hardware in the MRI. And we'll talk later about sort of the hardware of EEG, MEG uh, uh, recording uh, later in the course. So, but we'll, we'll start off with, the, uh, with the, uh, the MRI hardware. What are the main parts? And uh, there's enough people, maybe we'll, we'll take, a, uh, take a field trip at, at some point to the MRI center so you can actually see, see, see the giant, ma the, it's giant always on magnet. Uh, it's not plugged in. <laughs> it's just like, it just goes around by itself. Power goes off, still on. <laughs> it's, uh, it's really a cool, expensive thing. And uh, so uh, just a quick lecture on hardware, but then we'll quickly talk about uh, uh, spin versus precession. So MRI is all about precession. And to understand what's going on there, uh, it's, it's actually based, the ideas you know, behind spin and precession are based on original mechanical ideas. And every year I always, uh, <coughs> you've, ever, you've ever seen, has anybody ever seen a top that looks like it's got a spike like this, top like this with a little thing around the top? Has anybody ever thrown one of these things? So what you do is you, you, t you, you wrap, a, wrap a bunch of string around the, it's quite a dangerous thing, you wrap a bunch of string around the, the top and then you, then you throw it and yank back and you can get the top spinning really fast. And <clears throat> what it'll do, is, so it's spinning around its axis, but it will start to sort of precess. And that's what <coughs> MRI is all about. It's about that precession motion. So like you've got spin around the axis, but then this much slower movement that's around in a circle. And so we'll, we'll look at how that applies to these, to these hydrogen atoms basically is what we're is what we're looking at the precession of these hydrogen atoms in a strong magnetic field so we'll talk about uh, talk about that it turns out if you actually look at the math of a top like what causes precession it's actually more complicated than the math of the proton tops uh, protons are they all weigh the same they all have the same spin so it actually sort of it's actually simpler the way that the protons work, the precession of the protons work is actually simpler than a real top. But we'll sort of like make the analogy with a real top so you can see. This is just a very concrete physical analogy. Same, uh, same equations, classical equations for describing this. Okay, so that's uh, <coughs> later in the week. Uh, and then we have to talk about, uh, before we get started, we have to talk about multiplying vectors. Uh, so, the Bloch equation is a vector differential equation. So it's got. Um, so what does the differential equation mean? It just means like, let's predict what the magnetic field vector is going to be a slight distance into the future, just a microscopic amount of time into the future. That's what a differential equation is. It's an equation that describes how to sort of predict where it's going to go to next over a very short period of time. So. But it's got vectors in it. And so there's going to be some vector multiplication. It turns out there's a number of different ways of multiplying vectors. And you might have done this, or maybe you didn't. It doesn't matter. Um, so there's the dot product. So we have to sort of go over, you know, what is, what is a dot product? 
And then critical for precession, there is the cross product. It's a, a different way of multiplying vectors. There's actually a cool way called geometric algebra to sort of combine both of these into a single, into a single kind of multiplication. But the standard way that physicists do talk about it, they talk about sort of a dot product versus a cross, cross product. And then, but there's another kind of multiplication of vectors uh, multiplying complex numbers. And that's, uh, so complex numbers, complex numbers are, you can think of them as a vector. So, you know, what is a, what is, it's a two component number, you know. So if you, uh, if, if you have that complex number, you can represent it as a vector and it's got like a real part and an imaginary part. So it's got two one easy way of thinking about it is it's got sort of an X and a Y component. It's got two numbers. So you can multiply complex numbers. You can multiply those two component numbers. But the rule for multiplying them is different than the cross product for multiplying vectors. It's different than the dot product. So we have to sort of go over all those, make sure we distinguish them, allocate space for them. So we'll sort of go over that uh, at the end of the week. And then... Once we have that, then we can talk about uh, the Bloch equation. So the Bloch equation basically describes pretty much how all of MRI works. All the different parts. So like you, you have a radio transmitter in the, uh, in, inside the MRI. It describes how that radio transmitter causes the precession to occur. It describes how the um, the the actual speed of the procession, you know how rapidly the things are processing around, and then it describes how the this this procession decays. So, uh, and it describes how the gradients that you turn on when you're doing the recording, how those affect things. Uh, so it, it's pretty much got everything in it, you know, like the actual st stimulation of the protons turning on the gradient, how the B0 that's always on, that's how, how that affects the precession, how everything decays in, in a couple different, along several different axes. So it's got everything in it, pretty much. And so, so, that's, so the first thing we talk about, you know, is understanding the equation. It's, it's a classical equation, not a quantum mechanical equation. So it's a, it's a vector differential equation. So we have to sort of like, you know, look at it and just try to play with it. So the way you understand these things, at least the way I understand them, it's like a little machine. I got to like fiddle with it. Like, what if I do this to it? What happens? And what if I do that to it? What happens? That's, that's how you really begin to get a, a feeling for the equation. It's not an abstract thing. It's just like a little, it's like a little toy. It's a little machine. So, so we'll play with it that way, sort of see what happens if we change different parts of that equation, what, what, what does it do? Uh, but that's the prediction of a tiny bit into the future, but it's not, actually, it's not actually a solution. And so completely separate from that, we have a solution to the equation. So, so what does that mean to sort of like have a, you know, we've got an equation and we've got another equation that's the solution to this other equation. There's two equations. So, so, so we'll go over sort of simple differential equations to get an idea of where the solution comes from. In practice, you don't mess with the vector differential equation. You just you mess with the solution. That's how you try to figure out what the contrast between gray and white matter is going to be. You use the solution, the solution to this vector to this vector differential equation. So, so we'll we'll clearly distinguish those two. You know, how do we get this? Where does this one, how do we get this one out of this one? So that's sort of the differential equations, page, page one, and one, one and two. And there's other pages, but you know, it's just all more, it's kind of more of the same. It gets, <laughs> it gets more complicated, but if you can get the fundamental idea of how, how an equation could be the solution to another equation, that's, I think that's what we're going to, we're going to try to, try to do. Okay, so that's the Bloch equation. Um, and like I said, that's, that's very practical if you're just trying to sort of calculate, you know, if I change this parameter on the scanner, is that going to improve my gray-white contrast? It's a very practical thing. You know, how do I, how do I get better gray-white contrast? Or if I'm trying to get some contrast, 
I'm trying to get some functional MRI contrast, like my oxygenation signal. How can I improve? Wh which, how should I change the parameter to make the contrast that, I, uh, and that I'm seeing in, in the signal the, uh, the biggest between an activated and a non-activated part of the brain? Okay, so that's the Bloch equation. So you usually do that. They usually do that in some MRI classes. And I've, you know, I've seen a lot of MRI classes you know, over the years. And usually what happens in, in MRI, I was in London for about 10 years, and they have some really good physicists in London. And uh, they teach some, some classes, and all the psychologists come to the classes, you know, MRI for dummies. And they sit in the class, and... Um, the physicists start off, everything's going good for about like five minutes, six minutes. <laughs> so, and then, and then they just lose the class, completely lose the class. But everybody's too proud to say like, you know, I, I completely didn't get that. <laughs> and then at, at that point, you know, it's all lost. <laughs> like the whole, the other like, you know, 55 minutes of the class, you know, the physicists are talking, but they, the psychologist got lost in the first five minutes and, and there's no turning back. <laughs> so we don't want to do that. So I'm, if, if somebody gets seriously lost, um, even if it's halfway through the class and you jack up the courage to ask me a question about something that I talked about at the first minute, that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> that's, 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 that's what we want. Uh, so so um, why, did I sort of, uh, why did I sort of say that? Well, the next thing we'll talk about is the signal equation. And so one of the problems... Most of the physicists who teach classes for psychologists say, like, well, the, the psychologist can't understand this, and so we're not going to tell them. <laughs> uh, but if you don't understand this, all is lost. You, you can't understand how, how MRI works. And so what is that about? Well, you know, you've got, you have a head here. You know, here's uh, there's a person, happy person in the magnet. Um, and then you've got a coil. And here's, so here's this coil, sort of like, you know, uh, that's next to the person's head. And so that, uh, that uh, coil is giving you uh, a stream of numbers. You know, so a stream of numbers will come out of that coil, you know, over time, like that. that that's what comes out of the coil. Some voltages will come out of the coil and they'll go up, go up and down. But it turns out um, that's not good enough. <laughs> you need two streams of numbers out of that coil. Uh, and they're actually complex numbers. And so the question is, how, how do you get you know, the imaginary part? It's not imaginary. It's a real voltage. So how do you get a complex number, which is a vector, out of just a single set of scalars? Fundamental, basic thing about how the, s the signal that comes out of, the, out of the head is recorded. And so we have to go over that and really understand it. You, you need complex numbers to, uh, to understand it. But it's, you end up with two real voltages. You actually split this thing into two. And so we'll just talk about, you know, how does, how does that happen? And if you don't do that, like I said, all is lost. Can't understand how MRI works. So, um, so we'll, go over, we'll go over the signal equation. Uh, and then, so then uh, we'll talk about the Fourier transform. Uh, so we'll spend uh, at least a week or, or, or more on the, Fourier transform. So and that that involves that involves complex numbers also. So so basically, the, what, what the goal of this is that <coughs> it turns out the way the MRI magnet works is you mess around with the gradients and all these other other you know you turn on the 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 radio transmitter and you mess around with the gradients, but what ends up coming out after you make two streams of numbers out of one stream of numbers, <laughs> what ends up coming out of the scanner is a Fourier transform of the brain, amazingly. Th so it, so this, you, you actually physically perform a Fourier transform of the person's brain, and the data, the raw data that comes out of the scanner is basically something very close to a, a Fourier transform of the brain. And so once you've got that, then all you have to do is do an inverse Fourier transform. And the amazing thing about the Fourier transform is that's the same as the Fourier transform. <laughs> so if you, you take something and Fourier transform it and get something, and you Fourier transform it again with what, just one little sign change, you get back to the original thing. So how the 
heck does that work? So we'll go over, we'll try to really get a feeling for how that could possibly be true. <laughs> that if you do two things in a row, you end up with what you got at the beginning. And so that's how you actually do the reconstruction of the image. You, you mess around with the magnet so that you end up with a Fourier transform of, of the brain in your data, and then you just reverse Fourier transform it, which is the same as the original Fourier transform, same process, and then you get an image with all tiny little pixels. Even though every signal that came out of your head, every part of your head went into that coil. And yet somehow you can get like little tiny millimeter voxels out of it with the magic of the Fourier transform. So, so we'll spend a good, good amount of time on that. Okay, so then we have to sort of, you know, introduce sort of the, some of the basic concepts. So, uh, you know, how do we select a slice? We don't always select a slice, but sometimes you do. You might select a, you know, a slab through the brain. Uh, so we do a little bit of... That involves the Fourier transform again. We have to use the Fourier transform again, but we already have it under our belt here, so we use it again. Uh, and then, you know, how do we actually, you know, relate uh, the MRI signal to a Fourier transform? So that's, you know, how is it that all this stuff we do with the gradients makes a Fourier transform? And then, you know, how do we reconstruct things, which is just to do another Fourier transform. So that's, that's very general, but not very practical. And so then, uh, then what we'll do is go over, you know, practical pulse sequences. Because uh, that's sort of very abstract. You know, wh 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 if you actually have ever been in an MRI scanner, you can hear us going, it's making all these noises because the gradients are doing all different kinds of complicated things. So the practical pulse sequences are a lot more complicated than this. And so we'll go over, you know, all different kinds of practical, you know, like fast, you know, gradient, echo. We'll talk about echoes and, uh, and then we'll talk, you know, a bunch of those. We'll talk about diffusion. So it turns out one of the things you can do with an MRI scanner is you can look for a tumor uh, by seeing is it brighter than some of the surrounding tissue. But another thing you can do is you can actually measure diffusion. And diffusion means like just the tendency of molecules to diffuse in a particular direction. And so with an MRI scanner, you can pick up the tendency of water molecules to diffuse like about a hundredth of a millimeter in one direction versus another direction. It's amazing. Uh, you can't see a hundredth of a millimeter voxel. So it's like within this voxel, it's maybe two millimeters. We can tell that the water molecules diffused a hundredth of a, you know, a millimeter in that direction more than they did in this direction. And so how does that work? So that's a completely different way of sort of setting up the MRI to detect uh, diffusion instead of just detecting like the brightness of different of different tissue types. So so how does diffusion work? You can also measure perfusion. So it's possible to actually sort of measure how the blood flows into a slice, like how much blood flowed into a slice by sort of tagging blood and sort of watching it sort of flow into a slice. So that's that's yet another completely different. Uh, different way of setting up the scanner. So the scanner is quite uh, it's quite flexible compared to something like x-rays. Like with x-rays, you, you have a sort of a basic x-ray. Here we can sort of like completely change what properties of the tissue we're measuring by sort of fiddling around with the scanner. So it's quite flexible that way. Okay, and so then we'll talk a little bit about the general linear inverse which is the way that people uh, analyze MRI data. So the world is not linear, but it's, everybody says, well, let's just pretend like it is. <laughs> so we'll, we'll see what that is. And to do that, we have to go over convolution. And convolution is another thing, ev you know, every educated college student should know about convolution. <laughs> it's a real basic thing. So what is convolution? Convolution would be something like, you know, say we just turn a light on like that, and then we look at what happens in your brain. 
And then with what's going to happen in your brain? Well, you know, there's going to be some noise, and then, you know, there'll be a little signal. That's convolution. So how, how do we do that mathematically? Uh, so we'll talk about uh, convolution and deconvolution for the general linear inverse. How does this is how everybody basically analyzes their uh, their MRI data, and then we'll talk about the cortical surface. So, so normally, so a lot of work in fMRI is scanning the brain, looking at looking at the cortex. There's more than the cortex, but the cortex is big and sort of. Um, it's really big in us, and so there's a lot of you know, effort put into the cortex. And, but the cortex is actually... So when, when you scan the cortex, so here's a little chunk of the cortex. Looks like that. Uh, when you scan it, you get basically you know, a whole bunch of little cubes like this. And, and we, you know, we analyze a lot of the data just looking at those little those little cubes or voxels. But what we really want to know uh, is, you know, what's going along in this direction? Because there's a lot of maps in the cortex. About half of your cortex contains maps of your, of your retina or your body surface or, or your cochlea, different pitches, different frequencies. And so, so we'll... So a lot of people, like me, have developed these methods for reconstructing the cortical surface. So how do we sort of like reconstruct the cortical surface, and how do we analyze that cube data on the cortical surface? Uh, and that makes it much easier to see a map, because you, know, you can imagine if you're just looking at a 3D block of cubes and you're trying to see some little curved you know, map going around there, it makes more sense to do that analysis on the cortical surface. So we'll sort of go over you know, how does... How does that work? Why is it advantageous to you know, look at stuff on, on the cortical surface? Okay. Um, uh, then we'll talk about uh, uh, the source of MEG EEG. So all this stuff about MRI is unfortunately, it's got good spatial resolution, but the temporal resolution isn't very good. And why is that? Well, we're not actually recording the activity of the brain with MRI when we do functional MRI. What are we recording? We're recording mainly, if we're doing f standard functional MRI, we're recording the oxygenation level. And w why does that even work? Well, the reason it works is because, you know, your brain is unbelievably demanding of oxygen. So if you, if you just squeeze off a little blood vessel in your brain so that no oxygen gets to some part of your brain, it'll die in 60 seconds. Now, you can hold your breath for 60 seconds, no problem. But in that case, there's oxygenated blood going through the brain. So your brain is extremely sensitive to lack of oxygen. And because of that, you should always eat a lot of carrots and, and broccoli and potatoes. <laughs> right? very, keep that circulation going so that everything, everything's... Uh, you know, everything's uh, good that way. But the reason that we can record fMRI at all is because as soon as some part of the brain becomes active, within a second or a half a second, the glia around there detect, oh, we need more oxygen. And it quickly dilates the vessels so that more oxygen will arrive, arrive at that part of the brain within a second or two. So within a one or two seconds, that part of your brain immediately gets more oxygen. And so that's what we're recording. So we're not really recording the actual activity, we're just recording sort of the exhaust or the, <laughs> we're just recording the, the, you know, the power supply. But MEG and EEG are actually recording the real signal. They're recording the real, the real signal that is caused. But we have to understand, like, what causes EEG to even be visible at the scalp? So, like, some ac electrical activity is going on in your brain, but what aspect of that electrical activity is visible at the scalp? Turns out not all of the Activity that happens in your brain is visible at the scalp. Only certain, it's only certain kinds of oriented structures stimulated at a particular point in the oriented structure with a particular sign of stimulation. Is, that's the only thing that's going to be visible. And so we have to sort of first understand like what, you know, what signal can we actually see? So that's, the, that's called the forward solution because you start from the actual signal and then you figure out like, 
what happens, how does that actual signal that's causing some electrical activity here, how, how does that get transformed to a, a stream of data coming off of an electrode or coming off of a, an MEG detector which detects the magnetic fields caused by the currents in the head? It's, it's, it's another way of recording the same signal. So, so we talk about that, and then, and then we talk about the inverse. So the inverse solution. So the inverse solution is basically, <clears throat> we've got some data on the top of the head, and so you know, where did it come from? And so that, that's much more complicated than in the case of uh, MRI. And so it's, it's actually harder to localize electrical and magnetic signals uh, from outside the head. There's a lot of problems with that. So we'll just sort of go over like what are the problems with trying to, how well can we look? We can actually localize reasonably well within a couple centimeters. That's not too bad. It's not anywhere near as good as, as fMRI, but yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty reasonable. And so we'll go over sort of the inverse solution, problems with the inverse solution. How does the inverse solution work? It's linear. It's another linear thing. So, um, uh, and the advantage here, like I said, is that you're actually recording something that's, that's actually the real activity of what, you know, of your, uh, of your brain doing something as opposed to just like the power supply. And that, that, that will be pretty much the end. So, question? Okay, so that's, um, <coughs> that was kind of the main, the uh, main, main topic. So, it'll be about two-thirds or, you know, a little bit, something like two-thirds on the MRI and the Fourier transform and the and differential equations and then, and then maybe a third on sort of cortical surface and, and EEG, uh, MEG. So if, you know, if you've ever done an EEG or, or know people that do EEG, most of them don't localize things. Uh, but I, it's important to, just because they're not localizing things doesn't mean they're, they're not looking at a signal that could be localized. <laughs> so, um, so we'll sort of go over, you know, go over this and maybe motivate you to say, like, why we should try to localize, <laughs> you know, even if it's not really good localization. And we can also talk a little bit about how to try to combine these two, like combine uh, MRI with, with EEG uh, or MEG signals. Okay, so that, uh, that's the basic summary of the the class, so any questions about sort of the assignment or the struggling to use MATLAB or you can work together, I'm happy if you do. Uh, uh, how to turn in the assignment, <coughs> the, uh, the paper, remember the paper is you have to just pick, pick out one f original methodological literature paper it doesn't have to be really new. You know, it could be like 10 years old. That's okay. 10, 15 years old. That's okay. And then just go through it. Just try to understand one sort of original literature paper and summarize it for me. And look up some of the, you look up some of the papers that it refers to. And then the lectures are all, lectures will all be, um, all be online. So you can go back and look at them double speed. <laughs> okay, is this sort of what you're kind of expecting? Everything? <laughs> it's not, not too much of a shock. Sounds good. <laughs> Any other questions out there? And, and definitely, you can't hear your questions on the recording. <laughs> Sounds good to know. <laughs> so it doesn't matter. You can ask the dumbest question possible. No, no problem at all. It can't be heard. Your face cannot be seen. <laughs> so... <laughs> So, um, so feel free to interrupt me when, when we're going along. If something isn't clear, I'm, I'm, I'm totally fine just to start over again. Okay, any other, any other questions? I can, tell, I can tell when you're actually not understanding something. That's why I like having people in the class. Because what happens is people stop moving when they don't understand things. <laughs> they go, it's like, don't do anything. Don't make any noise. Okay? <laughs> you might stop. <laughs> so that, that's the advantage. So if there's a little fidgeting going on, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> people are, 
doing okay. Like when everybody gets really quiet, I know, like, you know, that's not good. <laughs> okay, any other final questions? All good? Okay, so see you on Wednesday. No class on Friday at 8 a.m., but there will be a class Friday at 9 a.m.